Hello and welcome. Uh, as people will start to filter in, um, <clears throat> I'm Dr. Maggie Ganey. I'm um, on the advisory board for Mental Health America of Spartanburg County. Um, and you may remember me as the executive director um, the last couple of years, but uh, Ross Hill, our fearless leader, who is our current executive director, is on vacation um, right now. So I'm going to be uh, hosting our presentation today, but also be one of the presenters. So um, we'll give everybody just a minute to get uh, into the call, and um, then I'll have a few announcements before we get started with the actual presentation. Well, first, let me um, just start by saying thank you to any of you that um, participated in our and, and supported our um, event uh, on April 29th, our Be Kind to Your Mind, really more of an education awareness event. Um, there was also some fundraising, of course, too, so that we can continue to provide the programs that we do through Mental Health America of Spartanburg County. Um, so thank you so much if you participated. And if you didn't, we'll be having our third annual one next year, probably around the same time. We haven't chosen a date yet, but likely we'll be uh, near the end of April because um, we'd like to plan it so that it can be a kickoff to Mental Health Month, which is what we're in right now um, in the month of May. Um, so we, we, we do welcome you all today. There are just a couple of um, announcements. First of all, um, in terms of get, making sure that you receive your continuing education credits, um, if that's something that you're interested in, there are a couple of um, steps to that. The first step is that you um, will need to pay for the $15 credit um, for the CE uh, that you would receive today. And I'm going to post a, uh, um, a link in the chat which is where you can go to do that. Um, oh, hang on just one second. I apologize for him. having some technical difficulties here. There we go. Okay, so this is the link that you go to to um, pur purchase the $15 credit. And then after you do that, um, you will also then go to, here is a, another link um, to do an evaluation. And once you do that evaluation, then you should receive your continuing education certificate and can print it off. Um, if you have any questions, I'm also gonna post uh, the, let's see. Hang on just one second. I'm going to post the um, two Word documents as well that will um, give you detailed instructions for both of those, the CE instructions for purchasing the credit as well as the um, evaluation, how to do that. So. Okay, so this first document that is posted in the chat is for purchasing the online credit. And then the next one I am will be doing is, is has the link and the QR code for how to do the evaluation. Um, it also has contact information if you have any problems at all with Spartanburg Regional's corporate education office who does the CE for us. Um, as well. So there's all the instructions for that to make sure that you get your continuing education credit for today. I um, also just want to mention that 
Uh, obviously, we're just virtual today, um, and part of that is because Emerge had flooding, unfortunately, um, during the heavy rain that we had and thunderstorms. Um, and so, at least for today and then July, our, all, our educational series in July, we will just be virtual only. Um, and so, uh, so make sure that you are aware of that for July. Our July um, Ed Series topic is technology use and couple relationships, and Morgan Strickland will be doing that for us. Uh, so hopefully you will consider joining us for that one as well. And then in September, the topic is how to be healthy during the holidays. Hi, Dr. Mercado Ortiz. <laughs> this is my... And this is my partner today for the presentation. I'm just doing a couple of quick announcements about Mental Health America stuff. So, and then we'll get started with the presentation. So those are a couple of the topics that'll be coming up in July and September. And then in October, October 18th, we've chosen our date for the Mental Health Symposium, which um, some of you have probably participated in. And um, it's always a really good experience. Last year, we had great speakers and I really hope that you'll be on the lookout for that. Um, I'm also going to post in the chat the MHA uh, website um, just so that you have it and you can, of course, get all this information uh, from our website. Okay, please feel free um, during our presentation today to post questions that you might have in the chat. Um, we will probably save most questions until the end, um, but I will be kind of monitoring the chat as we go along. And we also, as this is Zoom webinar, we also have the option of the Q&A. So if you put a question in that, that's fine too. I will check both as we go along and make sure that um, we try to answer all your questions uh, by the end of our presentation today. Well, let me inter I'll introduce um, myself and then Dr. Mercado Ortiz. I'm Dr. Ganey, as you know, and I've kind of already mentioned um, my, my relationship with MHA. My relationship with um, Spartanburg Regional is that I'm on faculty at the Family Medicine Residency Program, and Dr. Mercado Ortiz is one of our third year residents who's about to graduate and going off to do an OB fellowship. And so I asked her to do this presentation with me today, uh, specifically on postpartum depression. So, hello, doctor. <laughs> Is there anything Hi, else you want to say to introduce yourself? Or uh, No, I'm just honored to be part of the conversation. And thank you so much for inviting me. We're very glad to have you here today. Um, and, and, and the big reason for the reason I wanted um, Dr. Mercado Ortiz to be with me today is because, as you know, with postpartum depression, there are, it is a, it is, kind of the epitome of biopsychosocial in that there's so many pieces of it that if you don't aren't familiar with or or don't have a good working relationship with a physician or OBGYN or family physician that's seeing the patient, then you might not be aware of some of the pieces to what's going on and, and really have a good uh, treatment plan going forward. So I really felt like it was important for all aspects of this type of depression to be presented today. So let me pull up um, our uh, presentation. Let's see. Slideshow going here. Okay. I'm hoping everyone can see that. Can you see that, Dr. Mercado? I can, yes. Okay. okay, all right. And let me see if I can, I wanna make sure I can pull up the chat so that I can see that while we're going along. There we go, okay. All right, so, <clears throat> so postpartum depression. Um, the first thing that's really important to talk about with postpartum depression is what it is not. Um, so I think there are two things in particular that are really important to you know, discuss. And one is baby blues, which you've probably heard before, which is much more common. And we'll talk about the prevalence rate for both of those um, in just a minute. But with baby blues, what you're gonna see is frequent prolonged bouts of crying for no apparent reason. Um, maybe some sadness, some anxiety, feeling overwhelmed 
being a new parent um, obviously brings a lot of those. But this usually begins one to four days after delivery. So it comes on pretty quickly. It's more mild. Um, and it tends to resolve within about two weeks without any treatment at all. So that's what, we, what we're talking about when we talk about baby blues. And usually just so, some simple support from friends, family, a partner can help a person move through that process pretty, pretty easily, pretty smoothly. Postpartum psychosis is the other end of the spectrum, and that is a much more severe form of depression. Generally, the symptoms... Um, occur quickly after delivery. They are very severe and last for a few weeks to several months. Um, they can include severe agitation, confusion, um, insomnia, paranoia, delusions, hallucinations, sometimes even rapid speech and a, a manic mania kind of um, presentation. There is a much higher risk of suicide with postpartum psychosis or risk of harm to the baby. These folks who um, get to this place with postpartum psychosis often need psychiatric hospitalization um, as part of the treatment plan. So those are not what we're talking about when we talk about postpartum depression. Um, so let's go on and talk about um, just sort of how common these things are. So baby blues affects between 50 to 75% of people after delivery. So very, very common. Um, and most women who, um, have have had more than one uh, delivery will will tell you they've experienced a little bit of this um, after they've after they've had a child. Postpartum depression affects about one in seven new parents, and that's gone up a little bit. Our numbers uh, used to be about one in nine. We're now around one in seven, and some of that might be we're better at identifying it. Some of it might be um, that. Uh, patients are becoming more aware of it and are able to express themselves a little bit better to their uh, providers, but it's, it has gone up a slight. We also include in that that it's not just affecting the birthing person. It can affect surrogates. It can affect adoptive parents. It can affect fathers. Um, you know, so postpartum, we need to sort of have a broad perspective when we're talking about postpartum depression. It, it doesn't just affect the person who is giving birth. And then, like I mentioned before, the postpartum psychosis affects only about one in a thousand people after delivery. So it's a much smaller percentage. We're not going to see as many of those. Um, and we'll talk a little bit more about risk later. Um, but with risk with postpartum psychosis des definitely increases if you have, have had a consistently postpartum depressive experience after multiple deliveries. So, but we'll talk about that a little bit more. Um, later. Okay, so why is this important? Why are we talking about postpartum depression? Well, there are lots of reasons. Obviously, it's affecting not only the, the mother, the, um, it's also affecting the family, and in particular, is, it can affect the baby. And so we want to talk a little bit about why and how it affects the baby. So some of the possible effects, um, if the depression is, goes untreated, the parent could have problems tr and trouble bonding with the baby and doesn't establish a connection with them. That attachment is extremely important and you may or may not realize how important that is even with feeding and, and other kinds of health related um, uh, developmental stages for the child. The child may develop behavior or learning problems. Um, the parent may skip necessary appointments with the child's treating provider, which obviously could affect health overall. Um, the child may develop feeding issues, like I mentioned, with the attachment being very important with feeding and, and or sleeping issues. The child may be at higher risk for obesity. There's some outcomes related to that. And child may be at higher risk for developmental disorders. Obviously, the parent, if they're going through a more moderate to severe depressive experience, they may be more likely to neglect the child's care or not recognize when the child is ill. If they're if they're struggling to attach with the with the child, then that can be very much a potential outcome. And then, of course, 
there's some evidence that children who um, have parents, have mothers in particular, who go through postpartum depression without it being treated can develop some impaired social skills. Again, that attachment is so important. And if it's not occurring successfully, it can affect all these developmental um, issues. Okay, so how do we recognize postpartum depression? There are lots of um, sort of, I guess you could call them warning signs, things to look for um, in a family member or friend that you might think was, was experiencing postpartum depression. These are the things that most women who have experienced postpartum depression will tell you they have experienced at least, at least four or five of these. Feeling sad, worthless, hopeless, or guilty worrying excessively, or like I mentioned, even with the baby blues, feeling overwhelmed, but also feeling on edge, um, having a loss of interest in hobbies or things that they used to enjoy, changes in appetite, either up or down. So having an increase in appetite or having poor appetite, both could be uh, signs of postpartum depression. Trouble sleeping or wanting to sleep all the time, so again, either having trouble falling asleep, staying asleep, or wanting to sleep all the time. Crying for no reason or excessively crying. And again, remember with the baby blues, you might have some of that in the beginning, but it should resolve itself within a couple of weeks. Difficulty thinking uh, and focusing. Um, concentration can be definitely impacted. Even some people experience some short-term memory loss. Um, at this time and have trouble retaining information. Thoughts of suicide is definitely a symptom of postpartum depression. It's a symptom of any type of depress depressive disorder or wishing you were dead. So either passive thoughts or more active thoughts. Lack of interest in your baby or feeling very anxious around your baby. Uh, and a lot of that has to do with that feeling of overwhelm and not knowing exactly what to do or, or how to bond with your baby. You may even at the more severe stages have thoughts of hurting your baby or feeling like you don't even want your baby. And of course, as you can imagine, there's a lot of shame um, that's associated with some of these symptoms. And so many new parents won't even talk to their provider about these symptoms because of that shame. Um, it, you know, which reduces the likelihood of them being able to be treated or at least assessed and diagnosed early enough to have. Um, you know, good quality treatment. So the, it's so important as we're going through, if, if we're taking care of someone, whether in whatever capacity that may be, your a medical provider, your um, a nurse, your um, a psychologist or a therapist that may be seeing them for different reasons, during this postpartum period, these are some unique aspects of the depression that someone might be going through related to the postpartum period and helping them identify these is extremely important, especially if they're feeling a lot of shame around what, what they might be going through and not even understanding it sometimes. So when does someone need urgent or emergent care? If someone is having thoughts of harming themselves and they're more active thoughts, um, they're considering, they have thought about a plan to harm themselves, for example, um, or their baby, that is definitely an emergency. Recurrent thoughts of death or suicide, again, having those thoughts themselves may not be the emergency, but when those thoughts are coming up and they're sticking around and they're moving towards having, starting to have thoughts about plan or intent, then you definitely need to be considering what is the next step in terms of their um, treatment plan. Severe depression it really has more to do with that um, depressed mood most of the day, nearly every day. You can imagine if you're feeling that for at least two weeks, that's really where the diagnosis comes in. But when it's severe, you're probably not functioning much at all and probably not able to take care of your baby at that point. So that is an you know, important thing to kind of notice in terms of how frequently are you experiencing this and how long so far. And then lastly, if you're feeling any of these other things, anxious, guilty, hopeless, scared, panicked, 
or worthless in combination with any of those above items, then you definitely want to get someone into more urgent, uh, emergent type of treatment. Okay, Dr. McFadden. <laughs> yeah, so uh, going into more of the biophysical changes of um, the body, like postpartum that can affect or lead to or put someone at risk for postpartum depression. And so <clears throat> that can include um, endocrine changes or hormonal changes like that drastic drop in progesterone and estrogen that um, in itself can incite depressive like symptoms or behaviors or moods. It turns out that progesterone, um, it's the main hormone during pregnancy, right? So as soon as you give birth or the, the, the person gives birth, uh, that, that hormone at the levels that, they, that it was is no longer needed. Um, progesterone is something that's produced by the ovaries during the menstrual cycle. Uh, therefore, if you think about it, women don't start their menstrual cycle until a while, months, uh, maybe even a year after um, giving birth because the body focuses on breastfeeding and focusing its energy on giving, <clears throat> producing milk for baby. Well, estrogen, uh, for, for milk to be produced, estrogen has to decrease. Uh, therefore, you have like an increase in prolactin, a decrease in estrogen, a decrease in progesterone. And it turns out that progesterone and estrogen are both hormones that can uh, create, or they actually help in the synthesis of serotonin, which is the happy hormone. The, the hormone that tends to be deficient in, in uh, depression or anxiety. Uh, that's why we have our serotonin um, reuptake inhibitors. We just want more of that hormone or neurotransmitter to be in the, in the body. Um, well, it turns out that the hormones that do enable the production of that neurotransmitter are immediately decreased after giving birth. Um, there is an increase in testosterone in some uh, of the folks after they give birth, um, it, testosterone is also linked with an increase in, you know, depressive like behaviors and moods as well. Uh, birth itself is a pretty dramatic, uh, tra traumatic and dramatic process for the body. Therefore, there's a huge uh, rise in cortisol levels. Plasma corticosteroids tend to increase sort of this euphoric mood. And so you have a drastic drop in plasma steroids, thereby um, inciting the whole feeling down and less happy uh, type of situation. And it turns out that a lot of <clears throat> the hormonal or endocrine changes uh, in the body also include the thyroid levels. So there's women postpartum are high risk uh, for having uh, postpartum thyroiditis, which is a huge imbalance of, of thyroid levels. Uh, or permanent hypothyroidism. Uh, it turns out that the thyroid is, is heavily used during pregnancy in order to support the metabolism and the growth of baby. And therefore, after um, it actually goes up, right? the, the TSH or thyroid levels go up. And so after giving birth, there's a chance for it to go way up or way down and stay permanently down. And that just varies per, per woman. Um, people who already have thyroid issues before or peripartum or before pregnancy, uh, that can get potentially even worse, or they may need changes in their dosages of, um, of thyroid medication even after pregnancy. And so we may already know or not know that thyroid dysfunction is also correlated with depression and anxiety and, and um, just overall mood disorders. So those are just kind of the, the, the uh, physical, biophysical changes that can predispose uh, a woman in the postpartum period for depression and even psychosis. Uh, there are so social and psychological changes associated with having a baby. You know, your body changes rather drastically. There is a huge amount of weight loss that's supposed to happen in the first couple of weeks after giving birth. During the breastfeeding period, there is so much energy uh, used to create uh, milk that a lot of women end up eating a lot more or feeling hunger way more than they ever have before because their body desperately needs that energy. Uh, that definitely supplants the, the weight loss or they'll concurrently, um, contradictively, I mean, 
it'll lead to weight gain. So a lot of women end up drastically losing weight and then gaining it again during breastfeeding period. <clears throat> Lots of changes. There's way less sleep. And so we know that studies have shown that less sleep is less concentration, less higher function or critical thinking. There's less ability to make decisions quickly. And so lack of sleep in, in lieu of trying to help this other human survive um, really does affect overall well-being. And, you know, first time parents or even repeat parents can worry about parenting and then just changes in the relationships around you because you're um, now a, a parent uh, or you're a parent of an additional human being. And that's a huge change. It's a huge um, uh, smack to, to, the, to life. Uh, going on to the next slide. <clears throat> there are risk factors for developing a postpartum de depression, having a history of depression, or postpartum depression or premenstrual dysphoric disorder in the past can lead to that limited social support, particularly during pregnancy, even in a complicated pregnancy, like with gestational diabetes or preeclampsia, requiring more care and more and repeat obst obstetric visits can also increase the chance of postpartum depression if you don't have enough support during that. Uh, relationship conflicts, uh, if there was never a full convincement or decision about having a pregnancy or completing it, uh, there might be that can affect um, your behavior afterwards because you know having a child is a huge change can affect your your body and your brain. Uh, like I mentioned, pregnancy complications, um, prepartum and postpartum, including um, delivery and premature birth, can affect uh, postpartum depression risk. Uh, some being a single parent or a young parent can affect uh, mood overall and having a baby who requires a very, very drastic amount of support, you know, more than already a brand new human being requires, right? It's a huge change, uh, but having a special needs baby is even more uh, risky. Uh, so how is postpartum depression diagnosed? Typically in the four to eight week postpartum period, um, we give those couple weeks of postpartum blues, baby blues to, to kind of wind down. Typically, we don't suggest getting the depression screening, which is the Edinburgh Postnatal Depression Scale, right after birth, because we know there are a lot of hormonal changes that are still happening, and it's not quite accurate. So within the four to eight-week postpartum period, it's the most accurate time to do this depression screening. A score of 11 is quite diagnostic, particularly if the one question, I should have shown a picture of the Edinburgh um, questionnaire, but there is one question, I think is question number 10. Are you suicidal? Do you want to die? Something like that. If that one is positive, you automatically want to start treatment. Uh, you would want to repeat or reassess screening if the score is five to nine um, within a month or so. And then <clears throat> you want to rule out an organic cause of, of mood disorder, like we spoke about thyroid dysfunction, particularly if the patient already has a family history or a, a personal history of thyroid disorder. Um, and postpartum depression is something that can be diagnosed a year after delivery. I have a patient who actually had postpartum psychosis and was not diagnosed. The patient came in, I want to say like three or four months after giving birth and had very obvious thoughts of um, not wanting to be here and not wanting to take care of baby. It's more of a neglect of baby rather than hurting baby, but she was seeking out help because she wanted to, she had even thoughts of hurting baby. And this was four to five months out. Um, so you can diagnose it very, very further out from um, postpartum period. Uh, and then how is it treated? The first step is always psychotherapy. I would consider that for your milder um, depression patients, those who have a, a really good support system uh, and who are very sure about the plan, right? Or, or have very good follow-up. Uh, psychotherapy, cognitive behavioral therapy, or there's another form of therapy that we'll be referred to at the next slide. Um, very important, but in many situations, uh, medical therapy is needed. Uh, I mean, like medication assisted therapy. Uh, and your first line is the serotonin reuptake inhibitors like sertraline, fluoxetine, that's your Zoloft and your um, uh, Prozac, Zoloft and Prozac. Uh, your SNRIs are, um, it's the serotonin and Norepinephrine reuptake inhibitors, duloxetine or Effexor, those are great. Bupropion, mirtazapine, and tricyclic antidepressants or TCAs are a great option as well. You, none of these really have the, the 
worst effect on breastfeeding? That's a question that we get a lot is, um, is this going to affect my baby's ability to, to, ha to have my milk? And the truth is no. Uh, a lot, most of these, mostly the SSRIs and SNRIs have been proven that less than 10% end up in the breast milk uh, and they do not affect baby's health whatsoever. But all of these are safe in, in breastfeeding. Uh, and then if it's a, a very emergent situation where the patient uh, is obviously having suicidal ideation with a plan and they need to be admitted, you can use uh, bruxenolone. It's an IV, uh, I believe it's an SN or SSRI, I, uh, maybe it's something that could be used. I personally never used it, hope to never have to, but it is something that can be used. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> I was just going to talk a little bit more about the types of psychotherapy. Um, as Dr. Mercado mentioned, you know, that's really tends to be our first line, first go to when we're recommending a treatment plan for, for someone who has po postpartum depression. Um, if, if ideally, if we're able to get someone into psychotherapy, we would want them to be with someone who could provide um, more structured cognitive behavioral therapy or interpersonal psychotherapy, both of which have been um, shown to improve and also can are adaptable to the postpartum depression period. Um, so you probably are more familiar with cognitive behavioral therapy than interpersonal psychotherapy. Obviously, cognitive behavioral therapy is going to focus much more on our thoughts and our feelings and our behaviors. So how, how those um, affect each other and where we can intervene. So are there behaviors we can change? Can we help someone find um, behaviors that they can build in that can activate them? So for example, um, even movement and exercise, um, uh, even having a more routine schedule, those things can be very helpful uh, with depression. The other piece of that, obviously, is the cognitive part, and that is helping someone identify what the thoughts are that might be affecting the way that they feel. So what are some of the thoughts? And many times they are very irrational. We have all of these, uh, especially as new parents, we have all of these expectations that we put on ourselves many times, which are very unreasonable. <laughs> um, and um, we uh, tend to have a lot of shame about not being able to perform or not being a good enough parent or being a bad mother. It, uh, you know, you might hear your patients talk about that. Um, and most, all of those are very irrational statements, things that we say, say to ourselves that can uh, really affect the way that we feel. So with cognitive behavioral therapy, you're definitely gonna be intervening primarily with behaviors and thoughts. And that's that's what a therapist who's trained in that will, will be doing. That's what the therapy will look like uh, for someone who is, is gone, going to see a cognitive behavioral therapist. Interpersonal psychotherapy um, is more dynamically informed, meaning that it looks at dynamics in inter like intra per, like in within ourselves but also interpersonally within our relationships and they do that to, in order to alleviate symptoms but also to improve interpersonal functioning as you've seen in our um, presentation so far relationships and support are extremely important not only in helping prevent postpartum depression but also in the treatment process uh, with postpartum depression and so interpersonal psychotherapy really looks at that whole picture of not only what's going on inside of you that might be contributing to um, the depression, but also what's going on in your relationships um, that could be uh, targeted to help improve things. So it tends to be more, more in line with the biopsychosocial model, or, or some would even say like a family medicine model of care. Um, it tends to be initially short-term treatment of the more acute distress that is happening, but then there is a room for a longer-term and actually encouragement of longer-term maintenance treatment to reduce the risk of relapse. The, the first step with interpersonal psychotherapy is educating the patient about these pieces, the, the biopsychosocial, the the psychiatric symptoms, the symptoms of depression that they're experiencing, helping them understand that. Then looking at the interpersonal problems, maybe conflict that they've had, um, 
maybe there's transition in the role that they're experiencing from um, not being a parent to being a parent for the first time, or even being a parent for the second time, which we all know is a big adjustment too, you know, with multiple children. Uh, maybe it's a role transition with their partner. Uh, maybe their partner is not um, comfortable or struggling with this change or wants the wants them to be have a slightly different role in the parenting um, relationship. Maybe there's uh, problems with communication with their partner or family members and, and or maybe there's lack of communication. They're not asking for help or they're not asserting themselves about what their needs are. Many times there's also grief um, associated with the changes that are happening, like Dr. Mercado mentioned, the change in your body. I mean, alone, just being aware of all of that change can actually bring on some grief um, and the, the change of, of no longer um, being just a couple without children. That's a change. That's a, that's a big change for a lot of people and recognizing that and, and, and being able to move through that, but also to grieve um, those transitions is really important. So educating the patient about the biopsychosocial model and, and all the elements that are involved. It also, because interpersonal psychotherapy does, uh, is, it really emphasizes those relationships you have an opportunity to uh, bring in partners, bring in family members, friends into the therapy so that you can really look at what, you know, and target certain conflicts, certain changes, certain uh, role transitions that need to be addressed. Um, you also can educate the partner, educate the family member, the friend um, to help support the patient as much as possible. And so, the, the, both of these uh, types of psychotherapy and some, some therapists are very savvy at being able to utilize both of these types of theoretical orientations. And so, but those are specifically the ones that have been researched um, the most and seem to be the most effective with postpartum depression. The second type of therapy um, and, and that is strongly encouraged for folks uh, who have postpartum depression is support groups, support group participation. And even interpersonal psychotherapy can be offered in a group setting as well. So um, where you look again at all those different uh, targets that we talked about before. <clears throat> so the support group, um, as far as finding that, there are a couple of places online and I um, have put them here on this slide, but I will also uh, put them in the, chat for you because um, I think these are extremely important not only for people personally but also professionally if you're trying to recommend to someone um, where to go for this type of support. There are locators on both of these websites. Let's see. Just make sure I'm doing this correctly. <laughs> Okay, so both of those websites. Um, uh oh, did I stop sharing the? There we go. Okay, um, so both of those could be very helpful. They also both of those websites have a tremendous amount of research and um, other other resources for patients who have postpartum depression um, and their families as well. So, if I may interject, Dr. G. Sure. Sure. There is uh, there was a question regarding um, Spanish resources for, oh. for Spanish speaking moms and yeah. the postpartum.net does have uh, resources in Spanish and they have locations as well. This is an international website, so therefore, uh, whether it's a local situation, I'm not entirely sure, but that's a place to start. And there are Zoom support groups, too. Yes. Uh, online. Yeah, there are uh, many of the support groups actually are online. Um, at this point, but, um, you know, I think that's definitely something, you know, that I think it would be great if we could have more uh, in-person offerings within our community. So if you know of certain groups that are offered, uh, you know, locally, please, please let us know, pass on that information. It's important. So thank you, Dr. Mercado. That was good. Um, you know, I get questions a lot about, is this depression or is this anxiety? Could it be anxiety? Yes, absolutely. And 
both conditions are very common in the postpartum period. Uh, you know, we tend to speak more specifically about the postpartum depression, and that's obviously the term that we tend to use, but they, they often share many of the same symptoms. Um, and there may be the only things that are sort of slightly, slightly kind of focused more on the anxiety would be the excessive worrying, feeling panicky or having panic attack symptoms, or these really irrational fears or some kind of obsessive thinking that you might experience. Um, where you just can't get something off of your mind and it, it to the point that it keeps you from being able to function very well. But whether it's depression or anxiety, um, that you, this is definitely something that should be talked to, to the medical professional about, or if you happen to already be in therapy, but mostly, most of the time folks are going to be going to their, their physician for follow-up and they would, they would identify some of these things. Um, not only would they need screening, but in both cases with depression and anxiety, a lot of the treatments are the same. So, so uh, psychotherapy is very effective for anxiety as well. And so are all the medications that Dr. Mercado mentioned earlier. <clears throat> so how can we, if we're friends with someone who it seems like you've you kind of identified some of these warning signs, or it seems like they're, or they've shared with you that they're experiencing some of these symptoms of postpartum depression or anxiety, how can you help someone like that who's going through those things? The biggest thing is support, 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 support. So how do we support? We support by being a good listener to someone, to letting them know that it's okay and important actually for them to talk about what they're feeling, what they're experiencing. Offer to help them with daily tasks like cleaning, errands, you know. Um, sometimes family members are great about stepping in after the birth of a child and offering to do that. Sometimes not so much. So if you happen to be friends with someone and you're recognizing this, their, this experience with the they're, they're just completely overwhelmed. Being able to help with some of those daily tasks can al allow them to really focus on the baby more and that relationship with the baby. Um, also, if they're having trouble with feeding, that you know can uh, help the bond, which will again help with the feeding. Offer to watch the baby so that they can rest um, or sleep. Um, many times new parents feel like they have, you know, they have to use the time that the baby's sleeping to do other things. And um, that actually, no, they really need to be resting when the baby's resting. And that's hard, especially when you're aware of, you know, there's laundry to be <laughs> picked up, or there's laundry to be done or, or, or dishes or whatever the case may be. So offering to help so that they can uh, get some rest is extremely important. Encourage them to seek help from a mental health provider. Again, like we said, therapy, um, is psychotherapy is really the first line treatment here, um, getting them in to see someone who that they can talk to about what's going on and reduce the shame that they may be experiencing. <clears throat> Offer to set up and even go with them to a counseling appointment as just their support person. That can be very helpful and empowering to someone, especially, again, if they're experiencing a lot of shame about these irrational kinds of things that they're telling themselves. Um, and then knowing the signs of both depression and anxiety can help, you know, you as a support person know when it's important to really urge them to seek medical care. This last slide is just some of the references in particular that we, Dr. Mercado and I used uh, for today's presentation. Obviously there's lots of resources out there and those two websites that I mentioned in particular um, have a lot of good information on them. So don't hesitate to check those out. Um, also the, um, the U.S. Preventative Services Task Force, oh, I, there's a misspelling there, but <laughs> um, they have uh, a lot of resources as well as the CDC website too. So you can just Google most any of, and most of, most of those websites will come up with good, very helpful information. So now it's uh, 1245, which gives us a few minutes for questions. I know there, um, Dr. Mercado an answered one question might have been about resources that um, for Spanish Spanish speaking individuals. Are there other questions?
feel free to put questions in the chat or in the Q&A. Okay, we got one in the Q&A, Dr. Mercado. Um, is blood testing for hormones recommended early in treatment? Uh, it is not actually. We don't check a thyroid, not progesterone or, or uh, estradiol, just because we know that they're, um, they're dropping and they're gonna be sort of in flux. Uh, we typically don't check hormones for much of anything uh, uh, except for like infertility or, um, Honestly, that's that's about it. <laughs> There's not a lot of reasons to check for hormones. Uh, really, we go for a clinical type of diagnosis of so your presentation and your symptoms, and then we we know what we're going to do regardless. We're going to treat it. <clears throat> um, we know for a fact that after menopause, your estrogen will drop. We don't check your estrogen um, mm -hmm. for menopause. We just know that it happens, um, and we treat your symptoms, which is like bone loss or sometimes mood changes, um, hot flashes, things like that. So we, we treat postpartum hormone changes the same thing, the same way. Uh, you know, not everyone goes through postpartum depression and not everyone um, goes through postpartum psychosis. So it, it's not everyone will have to, um, we know what I'm trying to say is we know the symptoms that you'll present with if you have it and then we, we treat it as such. Um, now, thyroid uh, hormone, we can check, and that's typically about four to six weeks after um, the, the birth period. And the reason we would do that is if there are other symptoms that would indicate a thyroid disorder. Typically, there's like hair loss or growth, there's skin changes, there's um, pulse changes. There, there's, there are more physical signs of thyroid dysfunction um, rather than just mood. Um, so at that point, if I see a patient who has those symptoms or has a family history, then I would check a thyroid hormone. Yeah. I think you mentioned this before, Dr. Mercado, but how common is it for women to have a thyroid dysfunction uh, or, or develop thyroid disorder after having a baby? Um, it, it actually is quite common, like a postpartum thyroiditis is a real diagnosis, uh, and it happens because the thyroid has to become more active during pregnancy. Uh, we know that because folks or women who have hypothyroidism, uh, their TSH will become even lower, which means mm -hmm. their hormone is higher. Uh, it's kind, it's okay. kind of counterintuitive, uh, but it's all because of the, the, the prenatal process, you know, it's like if that it's necessary for fetal creation. Uh, but it, it, it's not, I say common, which means if I see it, I'm not surprised I see it, but not, I think I've seen it only once uh, in one in my patients here. I say, I wish I had an actual statistic to give you. Oh, no, that's fine. I just, I, I, I remembered you saying that it can be kind of common. I just um, wasn't sure how common. So, um, are there any other questions? I don't see anything in the chat or the Q&A at the moment. I will put um, both of our email addresses in the chat. So if you do have questions uh, for follow-up, feel free to send us an email. Um, let me grab yours real quick. As Dr. Mercado Ortiz's email as well. Any other questions? We got through that a little faster than I thought we would, <laughs> but that's that's not a problem. It's just there's there you know this is such a this is a big topic to be honest with you. Um, and it was kind of hard to determine exactly uh, all that we wanted to present. So we we totally would understand if there are other questions. Ah, oh, looks like there is one. 
I don't know the answer to that. Do you, Dr. Mercado? The question is, does Spartanburg Regional still offer table for two for breastfeeding mothers? Um, I am guessing not, since we neither one of us is aware of that, but that's not, I, you know, I don't know if we're 100% sure about that. I know that there are some programs that have changed since COVID um, that we have, we have we have had to drop a few programs here and there. So it is possible that that's not being offered currently. That's a good question though. So it actually, I just looked it up. It looks like it, it is still something okay. active. Um, the next date is May 24th. Uh, Fabulous. Yeah, so essentially if you go to sparbergregional.com slash events slash table dash two, you can register. It's uh, in second tower. So like where the, where the L&D is L &D. essentially the yeah. classroom. Oh, that's pretty great. I didn't even know about that. <laughs> um, That's wonderful. Yeah, I mean, I knew that it used to be offered. I just wasn't sure because I hadn't heard about it in a while. So I'm going to type it this. in here. Okay, yeah. Yeah, do you want to explain uh, what the table for two is? That's the next question we got in the in the Q and A. Dr. Mercado. Ah, she's putting it. Sorry, I was I was typing it in. Not gotcha, uh, sorry. <laughs> all right, so it, it basically a, a lactation specialist will. Uh, provide like a forum of support for moms, uh, breastfeeding moms, uh, and it really just talk about the challenges and the joys of breastfeeding. Um, so moms will come in to the second floor, park in our sort of L&D garage, and in the, take up the elevator to the second floor, and there's a classroom um, to the left, <laughs> to the left of the elevator. Um, and the bunch of moms and, and the lactation specialists will come in and discuss, um, it's like a support group, so concerns and needs and joys and things like that. Um, specific to breastfeeding there. Yeah, specific to breastfeeding, yeah. So there there is the registration required because there's a lunch included, but the attendance is essentially free. And I put in the website, uh, the link for anyone who wants to sign up or knows anyone who wants to sign up. It looks like it happens um, from 11.30 a.m. to 1.30 p.m. And it looks like it's every Wednesday. Yeah. That's awesome. Yeah. It's pretty great. Good. I'm glad whoever asked that question. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> Any other questions before we wrap up? Well, please don't hesitate to email us if you have any questions that come up after today. Um, I, my, I don't really know for sure, but my understanding is that you will get a post uh, event email probably tomorrow um, uh, through Zoom that will have you know other information in it. But as far as getting your continuing education, if you do want that, um, make sure that you um, uh, save the links that I put in the chat so that you can go and pay your $15 and then do your evaluation to get the credit um, for today. Um, we thank you all for being here with us and for asking such great questions. And um, please, again, feel free to reach out to us if you have any other questions. So thank you. Bye-bye. <laughs> oh, oh, thank you. You're welcome.